It's the stuff of childhood dreams. After 172 regular season and postseason games, it all comes down to one winner-take-all matchup at Trotho Canna Field. And this American League Championship Series coverage on TBS. It's Game 7 between the Boston Red Sox and the Tampa Bay Rays. The Rays take the field to thunderous applause, and here's the Kia Motors starting lineup for the Boston Red Sox. Coco Crisp has had a very hot run, again leads off in center field. Dustin Pedroia, the second baseman, will hit second. David Ortiz appears to be back. He's the DH. He'll hit third. Kevin Euclid making a bid to be MVP of this series for the Red Sox is the cleanup man. J.D. Drew in right field will bat fifth. Jason Bay is in left hitting sixth. Mark Kotze will bat seventh over at first base. One of last night's hitting heroes for the Red Sox, Jason Veritek, catches and hits eighth. And Alex Cora gets the start tonight at shortstop, and he will hit in the number nine spot. One of the heroes for the Tampa Bay Rays in Fenway Park in that third game was Matt Garza, who beat John Lester, only gave a run in six innings with five strikeouts. One of the keys to Garza, though, when he is on this year, two shutouts, three complete games, those shutouts, a one-hit shutout and a two-hit shutout. Shut down games. He has those games where he can go completely, manage his emotions. He sometimes can get hot out there in the mound and careful early. The Red Sox like to in these game sevens bury you early. He's got to be better than that. So Chris Pedroia and Big Poppy are coming up in the very first inning tonight. And the Boston Red Sox continuing their unbelievable history. 9-0 and in their last nine ALCS elimination games. And let's check in with the fourth member of our broadcast crew tonight, our colleague Craig Sager. Well, after batting practice and just prior to taking the field, Carlos Peña addresses the Bay teammates. He said, don't worry about beating Boston. Let's play our game, go out, and have fun. We are better than they were in the regular season. We have the best home record in baseball. No matter what happens tonight, it's been an amazing year. Let's enjoy it. Joe Madden, sensing a tense clubhouse, thought the message to be best delivered through the players themselves, and Pena had his blessing. Yep. All right, Craig, what's the old saying? Speak softly, carry a big stick. <laughs> yeah, it's all about playing baseball tonight. Don't get worried about the hype of a game seven. Go out, throw the ball over, catch it, and have good at-bats. And that's what Coco Crisp has been having in this series for Boston. He's five for his last eight, has supplanted Jacoby Ellsbury in the leadoff spot, and he's set to face Garza with tonight's first pitch in St. Pete. And a ball taken high, one ball, no strikes. One thing Boston knows about Matt Garza is he does not field his position well. He doesn't throw well to the bases, and that's why Chris was showing bunt. He's committed five errors this season. Terry Francona is well aware of that. They're going to try to put the pressure on Garza to field his position. Matt caught the corner, evens the count. I was watching Garza before the game. He had his iPhone in, iPod in, listened to his tunes. Well, now he's trying to tune out the crowd and get really into that strike zone as he has those earplugs in to try to tune out this real loud Tampa Bay crowd. He tried that in Chicago against the White Sox, and it didn't work. He gave up a free spot in the game and then pulled the earplugs out mid-inning. There's the bunt. Back to the mound. Garza's got it. Fires a fastball to get Chris. Well, you can see the determination in that throw. He said, you know what, I'll show you I can feel my position. First opportunity, he throws a strike. Coco Chris bunted for a base hit last night in his first hit bat, this time right towards the mound. And watch how deliberate Garza is. And he throws a bullet to Pena first out of the game. The key for Garza is that the only way he can throw to bases is he almost winds up like he's throwing to home. If he has to make that throw up and the little side slinger throw, no shot. So the leadoff man retired for the Red Sox. Here's Pedroia. Big swing and a 95 mile an hour fastball. We mentioned Pedroia and Euclid last year in game seven in the ALCS. They went six for ten, drove in seven runs, hit two home runs, and scored five runs. They were a two man wrecking crew. Pedroia talks so. 
confidently before game one in Boston with things looking so bleak for the Red Sox saying I've got 12 or 13 at bats left against these guys before this series is over his wish will come true tonight he's one for his last nine in the series and drives that one deep into the left field corner Crawford on the run that ball is gone a home run and the Red Sox lead To shut down the littlest guy on the field, but that's what they have to do if they're going to win this game. And Dustin Pedroia gets the Red Sox off and running with a bullet into the seats. His third home run of this ALCS, and Boston leads by a run in the first. Here's Big Poppy. David Ortiz down to strike. How big is an early run? Well, it's huge. It's huge if you're a starting pitcher, John Lester. You can go out there, you have a little room to work with, but it also sends a message to this Tampa Bay team that, hey, the Red Sox were here. This is seventh game. We own seventh games. To me, it looked like he was trying to come inside, but it either was a changeup or he did not get a lot on that fastball inside as Pedroia was able to hook that down the line. And there's that dynamic duo, Pedroia and Euclid, celebrating a first inning lead in game seven. Ortiz in game six. A double, an RBI single, and an intentional walk in five plate appearances. But what got him going, perhaps, was a triple in game four of the seventh inning. Ortiz, up to that at bat, had been 0 for 12 in this series. Since then, he's tripled, he's homered, and he's driven in four runs. Not a home run, obviously, part of that four-run seventh inning in game five to fuel the comeback. But Matt Garza, he is tough. Joe Madden knows that he's the type of guy that can overcome early problems. Well, you know, as a starting pitcher, you just tell yourself, well, you know, okay, hit home run. Great for him. Great for the Red Sox. Only one run. You know, no big deal. Shake it off. Here we go. We'll start anew. Can't let that, you know, that kind of stuff affect you. So count. Boy, he is throwing so hard that it makes it that's defense very vulnerable. Anything on the outside part of the plate, it's hard for me to believe that Ortiz is going to be able to pull it. Ball for Ohio. A homer and a walk back to back sets it up for Kevin Euclid. And speaking of that defense, here it is for Tampa Bay's Rays. Well, the Rays got off to a great start. They played seven straight airless games in the postseason. Great speed in the infield. Crawford, Upton, and Ball Deli. Longoria and Bartlett on the left side. Ewell Moore and Pena on the right side. And the development of the catcher, Deona Navarro, behind the plate has been dramatic. He has really taken the leadership role behind the plate for this ball club, and he feels the responsibility of getting Matt Garza through this game. So Garza will go to the stretch for the first time with Kevin Euclid up. Euclid has 10 hits in his LCS. Strikes. That never hurts, even if it's unintentional. 
The comfort level has been talked about as far as the Rays hitters being comfortable the entire series. And right now, Yuklas isn't sure where Garza is coming from with this pitch, but it certainly makes him a little uncomfortable at the plate. That went into and out of the Boston dugout. You don't think there's a little adrenaline in these dugouts right now? Euclid's hit that 96 mile an hour fastball into the Red Sox dugout. Euclid's just one for 15 against Garza, but throw that out the window. Think about how poorly he worked against James Shields. And Euclid's homered against him in the second inning of game six last night. And another ball pulled foul. One ball, two strikes. This one two punch, pretty dynamic in the postseason. This is the ALCS numbers. Pedroia 360, Euclid 370. They've hit five home runs together and driven in a total of 11 runs. Fly ball, right field line, ball deli on the run, basket catch, Ortiz has to chug back to first. Oh, tough play and right for Baldelli with that ball slicing toward the line. Well, you've got three center fielders in the outfield here with Tampa Bay. They can cover a lot of ground. This ball was slicing away from Baldelli all the way off the bat of Euclid. Watch the slice as Baldelli has to make the catch just inside the foul line on the warning track. Great stride, lots of coverage. He eats up a lot of ground with those long strides. So two around for J.D. Drew. Drew six for 21 in the series. Drew single, walked, and doubled in game six. And two for eight against Garza with a home run in his career. One nothing Red Sox on a Pedroia. One out homer. Very interesting to watch Garza work early, almost all primarily fastballs. He's trying to make sure that he rushes these Boston Red Sox hitters in to get them off the plate. Definite game plan by Joe Madden and Jim Hickey. Garza, a power pitcher, you figure he's going to have a high pitch count in this game, but. Is that something about which the Rays have to be concerned in this game seven tonight? Not an issue at all. All bets are off right here. You go with him as long as he's effective and you don't really concern yourself until you see signs of fatigue and that's going to be a while before you see that with Garza. One ball one strike Ortiz not held at first with two out. And a broken ball of beauty. Has Drew behind now one and two. You don't win this game Chip you got 150 days rest. <laughs> Good breaking ball. First one of the night here for Garza. Check swing. He went around. Navarro will make the peg to first. And Garza allows the Pedroia homer. And that is all in the top half of the first inning. One in Boston. John Lester to the mound. The Red Sox strike first. Now the Rays are up in their first. And the Tampa Bay starting lineup brought to you by Kia Motors. Akinori Iwamura leads off. He's their second baseman. B.J. Upton has had a huge series at the plate. So has Carlos Pena. So has Evan Longoria. So has Carl Crawford. Willie Ibar gets the start at the designated hitter spot with the owner Navarro. Rocco Baldelli hitting eighth and Jason Bartlett ninth against Boston left-hander John Lester. Pumps over a quick strike call 0 and 1. Both lead off hitters for each team faking the bunch on Lester. What a season he had this year 16 and 6. Struggled in his start in the postseason against these Rays, giving up five runs. Youngest Sox hurler, third youngest Sox hurler to appear in a postseason game seven. Big breaking ball 0 and 2. Well, that scouting report on John Lester. Extra days rest should help him. He's pitched 230 innings this year. Cut fastball is the key for him. He's got to get that inside. And game seven. Remember, he pitched a game seven against the Colorado Rockies last year. 
when the Boston Red Sox won the World Championship. That's tipped into and out of the glove of Jason Veracek. I'm sorry, I think I said game seven. The deciding game, game four, of course. Lester was defeated by these Rays in that 9-1 game at Fenway Park in game three. And what gives Boston such great hope, he has never lost consecutive starts in his major league career. And he leads tonight by a run and just missed high to Iwamura. Again, found at the plate. It's going to be interesting to watch Jason Veritek as he tries to really figure out this Rays lineup. Last time he faced them in Fenway Park, they hit him and hit him hard because he didn't get the ball inside to right-handers. Early on in this at bat to Ewell Moore, he's gotten the curveball into the mix, and that should help Lester get through his delivery early on, not just standing out there firing fastballs for effect. Ground ball hit to Pedroia, gives ground, and Lester retires the Rays' leadoff man. Well, you talk about defense meaning big things in postseason play. How about Boston's defense in this 2008 playoff? Nine game? straight airless games. Bay, Chris, and Drew in the outfield. Euclid has been remarkable at third base. Cora gets the start tonight at short. Pedroia and Katze on the right side, and the Gold Glove captain behind the plate, Jason Ferret. Uh, at nine straight or scared airless games is one shy of the Cardinals record of 10 straight that came in 2004. So here's B.J. Upton one of the offensive stars for Tampa Bay in this postseason. Seven home runs in his last 30 at bats. To put that in perspective he hit nine home runs in the regular season and over 500 at bats. Well, he has gotten hot at a most opportune time for Joe Madden's ball club. Looks to me like they've changed their approach on Upton. They're going to try to get him out away and not even mess with the inside part of the plate tonight. Save it for a pivotal pitch. And up and away for ball two. Two balls and a strike. And two curveballs in a row. So maybe going a little soft and avoiding that fastball inside. Well, what you're trying to do is lull him to sleep with that breaking ball and then pop the fastball inside. Still going with the breaking ball. And it's yanked foul to even the count. That was a good one there. If you watch the two curveballs before then, the kind of slow breaking to get them over, that one's a little harder. Almost looked like a fastball coming out of his hand. But now he's seen three in a row, and certainly Upton has to be wary of that breaking pitch, and that might make him just slow enough to beat him inside. If you feel lucky enough to take a shot, he's been hot in there. Upton's been a very patient hitter, too. 97 walks. In the regular season, and he works a full count now. Well, that was pretty interesting. They were trying to go inside, and he missed out over the plate again. Upton chasing some history in this game seven tonight. Barry Bonds in 2002 with eight, tied by Carlos Beltran in 04 for the Astros, and then Upton and Troy Gloss both with seven. Swing and a rocket hit to right. Drew retreats. Track wall just enough room. Upton hit it hard, but he's a second out. Interesting approach though. Instead of coming in, he got the ball down and away where Beckett was trying to go last night, keep him to the big part of the park, make him go to right field. Yes, he has great power, just not enough as Drew's able to catch up to that fly ball. Well, BJ Upton has been so good on the inner half and up, and I think they've changed their approach, and we're going to keep an eye on that as this game develops. That brings up Carlos Pena. He had a home run cut, and Lester's a man that he has liked facing. 
Six career hits, two home runs in 19 at bats. And three home runs in this postseason. Rays have done some early scoring themselves in this series. They have scored eight first inning runs against Boston. They're down to their last out in this opening frame. Now they have hit homers in the first inning of the last three games. That's a fast start, no matter who you are. Pena and Longoria hit first inning home runs in game four. A little tougher innings for John Lester this inning. You see the Rays' first inning runs. Eight first inning runs this series. The second to the Yankees in 98. John Lester had a little more difficult time than the first start. Remember, only four pitches in that first start in Fenway Park here up to 14. Right on by Pena, one ball, two strikes. I don't know about you, Buck, but his stuff is much crisper than it was in Fenway Park this yeah, early there, in the game. There's a little finish to it, and by that it means you just got late moving into the strike zone. Even the breaking ball you commented on was much sharper to up him. There's the computer working again. <laughs> <laughs> one ball, two strikes. And Pena rolls it out of play to stay alive. MLB postseason in Espanol. Live MLB postseason Spanish language feed is available via SAP. for the breaking ball to even the count. One thing I like about the Rays approach in this first inning, even though they're down by a run, they're patient. They're having a pretty good look at John Lester. Carl Croft behind the skipper didn't you good eye at the Rock Red Sox left-hander just to get a sense for what he's featuring here in this first inning. the ballpark too for Lester where things have not gone particularly well. Two career games, nine earned runs, 12 innings. Well, he's a different pitcher this year and it really started in May when he started pitching to the outside part of the plate to right handed hitters. He's been a pitcher throughout his career that owns the inside part of the plate to right handers the outside corner to left handers. He can throw a strike to that corner in his sleep. And he takes care of Pena with a sweeping breaking ball. Three up, three down. Red Sox by one after one in game seven. There's your score. One nothing as we head to the top half of the second inning. A look at tonight's umpiring crew. Big switch, which we'll explain in a moment. Brian Gorman calling the balls and strikes. Sam Holbrook, Brian Honor, Tim McClellan is the umpire at third. Alfonso Marquez down the left field line. Angel Hernandez joins this crew. He will work the right field line for game seven. Darrell Cousins was hit in the chest with a foul ball off the bat of Jason Veritek. Had to leave last night's game before the fourth inning. Tim McClellan came in umpired behind the plate the final six innings last night. And Darrell Cousins unable to continue in this game seven. So Hernandez a replacement umpire for this particular game and we understand Darrell is resting comfortably at home and should be okay. Yeah this happened with a Veritek foul tip. You can see how exposed the umpire is. This goes off the glove off the mask and hits him directly on the right collarbone and he would have to leave that game and Tim McClellan then took over behind the plate but we wish Darrell Cousins well. Two strikes to Jason Bay and to one ball and two strikes. Well, the thing that caused us to battle against is that if you're a young pitcher in postseason, the second inning you come out, the adrenaline's gone, your legs feel like they weigh 50 pounds each as we're trying to get these hitters out. Two and two to Jason Bay. Well, he has been a big RBI man this postseason for the Red Sox. And as this game progresses, should he come up in two out situations, that's where he's been very, very effective for Boston. 
They got a one-out run tonight. The Pedroia homer down the left field line to start tonight's score. Already taking the earplugs out. Check swing. Bayes retired. Second strikeout for Garza. One away. Well, he's one of these pitchers that up in the strike zone, his ball has lots of life. Ball on the outside part of the plate, and that ball takes off, beats Bay to the spot. And not many pitchers in the American League that can pitch with their fastball, but Garza's one of them. He's got two fastballs, that high four-seamer that rides well above the strike zone, and a very good moving fastball, a two-seam moving fastball that'll be 94 miles an hour. Mark Katze takes a strike. Katze's had a very solid ALCS defensively, and he's hit the ball hard numerous times. Seven hits. And he's trying to wear out that left center field gap in this series. And Upton has robbed him a couple of times. And that one up the middle. Bartlett behind the bag. Off balance throw to do it. Well, the defense got out to such a great start in this postseason. They had seven straight airless games, played 65 innings without committing an error, and then made five in the last 25 and two thirds. Bartlett made an error in game six, but this time, ranging behind second base, makes an outstanding play to take a hit away from Mark Kotze. Yeah, he was shading Kotze up that middle, gave him a good jump on the ball, and able to throw that ball off balance. The one term that Terry Francona used after game five in Boston was that Fenway Park came unglued. I think it's safe to say, guys, the Red Sox dugout came unglued after Veritek homered here in game six last night. That blast, the first hit for the Boston captain in this ALCS. His 11th postseason home run, but to a man, when we mentioned Veritek's hit in the clubhouse, every teammate lit up. And a high pop fly foul is out of play. Well, James Shields with the 2-0 pitch challenges Veritek who had the hit. And this big home run to right center field to put the Boston Red Sox ahead by one run. The one thing you talked about them lighting up, they know how much struggles he was going through. And they knew he wasn't hitting, but they know how much he gives to the team defensively and how much it pains him not to be an offensive threat. One ball, one strike. But Veritek also said, I can go 0 for 2,000, yet impact the game with every pitch that's thrown when I'm behind the plate. Yeah, there are two positions on the field that you can have a positive impact without hitting. Catcher and shortstop. The one thing that Veritek does so effectively is he separates his at bat from his catching. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard thing to do. A lot of catchers will take their overs back behind the plate and really crowd their decision making ability. Thinking about a bad swing in the previous at bat. Veritek never allows that to creep into his mindset. And a positive contribution as he piles up the pitches with Garza. Full count now at three and two. Cora, the shortstop, would hit next. There are two outs, one nothing Red Sox. You don't see many captains in baseball in this day and age, and very rarely do you see a C on the jersey of a ball player because of the transient nature of baseball nowadays. So many guys moving around. You don't have that kind of longevity to establish that kind of leadership position. Veritek has earned it and has been the leader of this team since he's gotten here. And the question is, will this be his final go around with the Red Sox? Well, that's going to be an interesting question for them. For people that aren't Boston Red Sox fans, you don't even know that he started in the Seattle organization. But he's considered, of course, a Red Sox.
Well, if you want to cut off an interview, cut off an interview with Jason Veritek, all you have to do is ask him about his impending free agency. He will end the conversation right there. He won't even acknowledge it. He'll walk away. He's not concerned about what happens after the postseason. He wants another ring on his finger. So his free agency has nothing to do with what they're trying to do here in postseason. How nice is that perspective in this day and age of professional sports? Refreshing. And another 3 2 fouled down the left field line and into the seats. A terrific at bat continues for Jason Baratek. Now, so much about hitting and playing baseball is about your mental state and certainly one hit can get things turned around we saw that with Evan Longoria in the first inning of game two we saw it with David Ortiz in the seventh inning of game five and maybe we're seeing it with Veritek now with his first hit that go ahead home run a breaking ball and it throws Veritek and the Rays are coming up in the second inning down a run with Evan Longoria to start things off in a one run game. It's one nothing Boston home half of the second inning and you can get exclusive camera angles behind the scenes info and more online with TBS Hot Corner. Check it out now at MLB.com slash TBS Hot Corner. Evan Longoria leads things off for the Tampa Bay Rays. He's 6 for 24 in this ALCS. And has done most of his damage earlier on, as you pointed out last night. Yeah, well, in his first couple of bats, you really have to bear down to get seven. Well, I can see a distinctive change in the approach they're pitching to Upton and Longoria. Trying to get strikes to the outside corner with off speed pitches. Baratek, you can bet, has had a conversation with the pitcher, the pitching coach, and the catching coach, Gary Tuck. So when you make a game plan change, everybody has to come together, but they've got to do something with Upton and Longoria. They've hit eight home runs in six games. And you might recall it's been a roller coaster postseason for Longoria. Had an 0 for 13 stretch at one point. And Joe Madden encouraged him to take his walks. And he takes a high strike for a 3 1 count. That ball was up and in, not a strike. Joe Madden not very happy with that call. Gets Lester back into the at bat. Ground ball to short. Cora gives ground. Long throw. Gets Longoria for the first out. Four up, four down for Lester. Here's Carl Crawford. Crawford 10 for 26 in the series with four RBIs. Crawford one of the stars of game four. With a 5 4 5 performance. That was in the game started by Tim Wakefield of the Red Sox. Crawford drove in two, scored three, and stole a base. He's one for eight since that five hit outburst. In our previous conversations with John Lester, he talked about the third and fourth inning being the most pivotal innings for him where he really gets into the flow of the game. He's tested all of his pitches, and now he has a feel for where he can go with each of those pitches. He really works like that a lot. A lot of times you will go through where you know if you have a curveball, you can use to get over for a strike, or you can use it to get a strike out. He's also been effective, guys, in limiting damage early in innings. He's retired the leadoff man in 18 of the 22 innings he has pitched so far in this postseason. Now, the running game is such an important part of the Rays' attack. The home runs of this series notwithstanding. And he 
gets Crawford a chase. Second strikeout. He's retired five in a row to start the game. Well, breaking ball away, cutter away. What's he come back with? Fastball up and in. Well, up and away it ended up being no chance for Crawford to catch up with that. Who's more of a low ball hitter? Jason Baratek loves to use the high fastball to finish at bats with his starters and especially with Jonathan Papelbon. Willie Eyeball the batter, and Lester's already done something tonight that no Red Sox starter has been able to do in this series. He's retired the first five rays in the game. And if he's a man that settles in in three and four in these innings tonight, it might be a very good night for Lester and Boston. the count. <laughs> Off his thumbs and hit to Euclid at third. Six up, six down. Lester and the Red Sox lead game seven by a run. But he's got that kind of, you know what. Third inning already in game seven. And Alex Cora starts things off against Matt Garza. Chad Lowry's gotten the bulk of the playing time for Boston at shortstop in this postseason. But Terry Francona likes Cora and his ability to handle fastballs. Yeah, he will start him against guys that have the bigger fastballs and feels like he's got a better chance. Plus his experience, he's not going to get rattled in a game like this, and he is a manager on the field, if you will. Very alert, very heads up, really gets into the floor of the game and can help out Dustin Pedroia. Not that he needs much help. At least not in this game, he scored the only run. And Cora shoots a ball to left. Crawford retreats. So six in a row after the homer and the walk have been retired by Matt Garza. And now back to the top of the Boston Motor and Coco Chris for trying to punt his first time up. Uh, Coco is getting a rude reception here because of the fight he had at Fenway Park when he charged James Shields. They had a little bit of a beanball war going, and Coco Chris got hit by Shields in the first inning in a game in June and charged them out. Ray's pinch at the corners, thinking about a punt, and Chris down a quick strike. Hench Kobe Ellsbury began the postseason as. The Red Sox starting center fielder and swung the bat exceptionally well against the Angels. But since then has cooled considerably. No hits in his last 20 at bats. And Crisp has gotten hot at a most opportune time. He's 8 for 16 now in this series. And he's buzzed down to the count even. Well, you know you have to have scouting reports on hitters and what their strengths and weaknesses are, but if you're going to throw at somebody, you better check into his background. Coco Chris Filer was a professional boxer in Los Angeles, and he handled himself pretty well, but boy, he got piled on once he got to the mound, and the rest of the Rays came to the defense of James Shields. And that's fouled straight back. Here is the center field comparison for the Red Sox. Quite a dramatic turnaround this year to last year. Coco Chris was the starter last year at the beginning of the postseason. Ellsbury got hot. They flip flop and the opposite has happened this year. Coco Chris having a great postseason this season and Ellsbury has struggled. Crisp stays alive here in the Boston third. The 
Jericho played 118 games this year for the Red Sox. Hit 283, seven home runs, and stole 20 bases. And like so many of his Boston offensive mates, they really worked the pitch count. Well, and he's really swinging the bat well right now. You can see how confident he is and how quiet he is at the plate. He had a great at bat against Dan Wheeler in game five. Fouled off several pitches before he drove in the tying run in the bottom of the eighth inning. But he is very quiet, very confident. He's tracking the ball very well right now. See how he wiggles his fingers on his bat. When Garza took so much time, he had the tendency to tense up a little bit and ask for time. We've seen that though from Matt Garza in Fenway Park. It takes a lot of time in between pitches. Two down. Four strikeouts for Garza. Well, he's got it all working. This is his good curveball straight over the top. Hard down and in to Coco Crisp. So the base is clear for Caballito, the little horse, Dustin Pedroia, who galloped around the bases with a solo home run in his first at bat of the night. Strike one. Another high fastball. If Pedroia can hit anybody's fastball, I don't care where it is or how hard it is, and that's up around. His neck and he jumps on top of it. He hit two here in game two. And he is just a guy that believes he can hit anybody, and you can't tell him otherwise. 5'9, 180 pounds. And that latter number might be optimistic. Now, here's a guy to give you an idea how beautiful baseball is. Dustin Pedroia was not drafted out of high school. 30 teams didn't think he could play in the major leagues at that point and he might win an MVP award this year 326 average 213 hits and scored 118 times for Boston it's a very unique hitting style doesn't he kind of just uh, that body just kind of springs towards the ball but one he keeps his head pretty level keeps the bat very level and I tell you one thing, he's had a million coaches tell him you can't hit like that. You got to cut your swing down and just hit the ball to right. He had 17 home runs with a big swing. And he loves hitting against the top 10 pitchers in baseball. Again, the American League top 10 in wins, he's hit 333. Top 10 in ERA, 310. Top 10 in strikeouts, 316. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. And he got popped. Garza hits Pedroia. And with two strikes, he won't even rub the spot. He stands at first with David Ortiz coming up. He won't give the pitcher the satisfaction of acknowledging that it hurts. Well, we've definitely seen this has been a game plan by Garza so far. He is going to pitch inside, hits him right on the outside of the elbow. Once that ball starts running in, it starts to track you. You have no chance. In the old days, when you hit a hitter like that, if there's a ground ball and play up the middle, you're going to see a hard slide into second base. Well, he can play old-fashioned baseball, too. Yeah. Red Sox bench seemed to question Garza when he buzzed Euclid. In the first inning, now Ortiz up and down the strike. It might have been a decent move early in this series when Ortiz was struggling. Not too good of a move now because a couple of hits last night, that big three run home run two games ago. Sometimes it can take just one at bat to get it clicked in for David. Iwamura playing in short right with the shift on. Ron Gloria up the middle as the Ray's third baseman. And Ortiz looks high as we've reached the 9 o'clock hour here in the East. It's Game 7 of the American League Championship Series. Buck Martinez, Ron Darling, Craig Sager, 
Chip Carey with you from St. Petersburg, Florida. Where Dustin Pedroia, first inning homer, as the Red Sox leading this game. Slides in hard and safely at second base. Well, the bar is a very good thrower, but he couldn't come up with the baseball. And take a look at the defense here. Longoria is going to third base. The shortstop will cover the bag on that unusual coverage because they're playing the shift. So when you have a base dealer running with Ortiz at the plate, you send the shortstop from that right side of second to cover the bag, and the third baseman who's behind second has to head to third to protect against Pedroia going from second to third. Only problem you have there is that you leave that whole right side open for David Ortiz on a breaking ball down and in, but really the only play you can make. Well, with two strikes, with two outs, you just as soon try to throw him out and get out of the inning. Struck him out in high heat. We head to the bottom of the third inning. Rays looking for their first base runner in tonight's game seven. The honor tomorrow, Rocco Balbelli, Jason Bartlett coming up against John Lester. And gentlemen, this is usually where if Lester's going to settle in. He does so, but he set down six consecutive men to start the game. First time that's happened in this series where a pitcher has retired the first six batters of the game. Navarro, four for 23 in the series. And the Rays wondering where their offense is going since blowing that 7 nothing lead at Fenway Park. Collectively, they have five hits in their last 41 at bats. Well, since that seventh inning of game five, they've been outscored 12 to 2. And Lester, one of the game's elite left handers, has an early lead. Way high ball, two, two balls and a strike. Well, if you want to watch a windup that you'd want to teach a young person, it's John Lester. He's got a nice athletic stance on top of the mound. Very easy, not a lot of moving parts as he approaches, throwing to the plate, repeats his windup almost every single time, and throws the ball out in front of his body. Just picture perfect. At the knees, two and two. He's beating him inside so far today, something he could not do at Fenway Park. Well, I think it's because he put the outside corner in their mind early. And then they've kind of shifted gears on him. And now, if he goes in there occasionally, it can be effective. Coming in there again. And it's popped up. Back behind the plate. Fair attack near the screen. Has run out of room. Jason Vertek is the one that encouraged John Lester to throw to the outer half of the plate. To the arm side of the plate where he can command the ball to the outer half. He's always been good inside with a cut fastball and a four seamer. But Veritek said if you're going to take it to the next level, you have to put both sides of the plate in the hitter's mind. That's when you become the most difficult to hit. Missed 
And the count fills up at 3 and 2. And so far, they're trying to entreat the home plate umpire, Brian Gorman, that I want to throw this back to a curveball. Stay with it for me. Gorman sees that it's just outside, kind of bending around the plate. Seven up, seven down. Third strikeout for Lester. Now he's in that mindset now where he can do just about anything he wants to. Yeah, he's got both sides of the plate. Everything's thrown for strikes. And I think, I don't know if you've seen this block or you, Chip, it seems like when the, the hitters since that fifth game for the Tampa Bay team, this seems to have gotten a little big over the last couple of games, almost like they're trying to do a little too much. Put the ball in play and try to get some consecutive hits, although very difficult against the tough Lester. They've only hit one ball out of the infield so far in this game. That was by Upton, who chased J.D. Drew to the warning track. And Rocco Baldelli is the hitter. Trying to reach and represents the game-tying run. Call the strike. One of the more inspirational stories in baseball. You can talk about Josh Hamilton, certainly with the Texas Rangers. Same can be said of Rocco Baldelli, sidelined with that mitochondrial disorder, one that nearly cost him his career. It's a disorder that took them a long time to try to diagnose, and a long time for Baldelli and the Rays to figure out a playing regimen that allows him. To be successful in short bursts with the extreme fatigue that that disorder causes. Yeah, he just can't work out over an extended period of time. He didn't play with this team till August 26 this year. And Lester strikes him out. Right now he's a pitching machine. Eight up, eight down, and four strikeouts in the game. But if the Rays are going to hit him, they're going to have to hit good pitches because he's not throwing any bad ones right now. And this is a great fastball. Well, he threw fastball in, curveball away, fastball away. Go sit down. Tell you what, when you're catching a guy like this right now, you feel like a catching genius. Oh, I can do anything I want. I'm going to try this one over here, and with a couple of these in there, a little curveball on the outside. And now Bartlett, the hitter. Jason's been a tough man for Lester to solve, but not this time. First pitch pop to Pedroia. Inning over. Nine up, nine down, and John Lester with a one nothing lead through three. Middle of the order for the Red Sox in the fourth inning. Kevin Euclid, J.D. Drew, Jason Bay are coming up. Matt Garza retired that trio. First time around for the Rays. Just one hit in this game tonight. And yeah, that hit a Pedroia homer. Euclid flied out his first time up. Baldelli made a long running catch near the line for the second out of the game's opening inning. Euclid carries a three game hit streak in this series into tonight's game seven. And his success continues in the American League Championship Series. Uh, now Garza and Navarro bringing the breaking ball into the mix. It's very interesting. Garza pitches on a lot of emotion, and I think that his last start against Lester, Lester got all the attention, little chip on his shoulder, and I think he's carrying one tonight. Everyone here, or the papers, if you read them, were assuming that the Red Sox would have to win this game. I think he's carrying that chip to try to stop that from happening. Yeah, he's carrying more than a chip on his shoulder. His whole team is yeah. on his shoulders tonight. And that emotion for Garza at times, as we alluded earlier, has been a double-edged sword for him. Uh, early in the season, it was misdirected. Second half of the season, he's been tremendous. Nicholas battles back to even the count of two and two. It's a shot toward Longoria at third. Throws on the run, scooped up nicely. Four out number one. Risky play, but Pena made it. One man down as Joe Madden, the 
Tampa Bay skipper knows these Red Sox well, knows tonight's game should be a battle. It is. Uh, we, we, we see enough of these guys between spring training, regular season, et cetera, now uh, this time of the year. But although I'll take it this time of the year, it's uh, both guys are throwing the ball extremely well right now. Joe, what are your hitters' reactions as they come back from facing John Lester? Obviously, you got two of them in game three at Fenway Park. How different is he tonight in your mind? Um, I don't know. I just, uh, it looks a little bit sharper overall. Um, he's mixing his pitches maybe a little bit more often. I don't know if the strike zone's is in his favor at this point. It's hard to tell from over here. But overall, I just say that um, primarily what I'm seeing is a little bit uh, more of a mix as opposed to just uh, fastball. And furthermore, I think he's throwing his breaking ball for a strike today. I'm more consistent with your guy Matt Garza is off to a great start himself. How does he look in your mind? Real good. Um, and for where, where we're at right here, if the ball's really finishing well, it's very crispy at the end. He's got that really good life fastball. Made one mistake on a changeup to get right at this point. So JD drew the hitter ahead in the count, one and zero. And talking to Garza at the start of this series, Ron, he mentioned that after that confrontation with Deonor Navarro on June eighth. It taught him not to throw angry pitches. As a pitcher, what does he mean by that? Well, I think that you can't misdirect all that emotion that you have out there. As Drew pops up to the right side. To the right. You're going to have emotion. You've got to use it that it works for him. What he was doing is getting mad at himself, which made some of his teammates felt like he was getting mad at them. And once that happens, you lose your team. So once he directed it in a better way, and he's done it by really concentrating on each and every pitch, and I think that's why he's had a lot better season after that brush up in Texas. ZRA through June 8th was 4.38, one run less almost over that one run less, 3.37 since then. Base is clear, two outs now for Jason Bay, who tried to check the swing but struck out, leading off the second inning. Foul is out of play. Not only has the impact of Navarro helped Garza, but Troy Percival played a very big role on this staff too. Percival is hurt, not on this ALCS roster, nor in that Tampa Bay bullpen. But Percival was expected to come back for tonight's Game Seven here in St. Pete. Yeah, he's a veteran influence not only for the relievers but for the entire pitching staff, and he's had a positive impact on just about everybody here on this roster. Ball one, strike one. Percival saved 28 games in 50 appearances for the Rays this year. And had some back and hamstring and knee problems that did not allow him to pitch in this series, but he could be active for the World Series if the Rays can win tonight. all the action of the 2008 World Series starting October 22nd at 8 o'clock Eastern on Fox. There's only one October. Joe Buck, Tim McGarver, and our friends at Fox know that the Philadelphia Phillies are the National League's representative, and either the Tampa Bay Rays or the Boston Red Sox will meet them Wednesday night. Top of the order now, and Iwamura is buzzed inside and takes ball one. Nine up, nine down for John Lester. With four strikeouts so far in the game. And a line drive is into left field. That's the first hit for the Rays in the last seven innings of this ALCS. And now the Thunder is coming up for the Rays. Fastball away. Stays on and not quite down enough to really make a good pitch to Evil Moore. Trying to keep the ball away from him. They pitch him very well when they get the ball away, but that ball had too much of a place.
Upton hit the ball hard his first time and took it the other way to J.D. Drew, who caught it on the track. Just to show inside. I don't think they're going to try to get him out inside. I just think they want to put that in his mind. We saw early in this game, breaking balls to the back door, sinking fastballs away. Outfield very deep all around for Upton. And he takes strike one. Ronnie, how about the effect of having to go to the stretch for the first time now for Lester in the fourth inning of this game? Well, I think that even though he's at such a young age, he's so polished at this point that he knows how to make that adjustment. Probably missed that fastball inside because it was the first pitch. But he also has to make sure he keeps his eye on even more on first base. But don't divide it too much because uh, Upton is such a threat. Foul and out of play one and two. Now Joe Madden told us before the game his team is not a very good hit and run ball club because the hitters change their style too much at the plate. He would rather having them free swinging. If he chooses to, he will start the runner, but he won't ask the hitters to hit and run. Run and hit is the way he described it. He said it is a subtle difference, and that's how Navarro was thrown out in game six trying to steal last night. Short lead at first, and Upton boots one foul, and out of play down the first base side. That pitch was in, but it was down. The pitches that Upton has hit out of the ballpark have been in and up above the belt. But Upton really impressed him, and that's why like he walked 97 times. His ability to foul off those really tough pitchers pitches. That one right on the inside corner. Upton, the second overall pick in the 2002 draft by these Tampa Bay Rays. And he goes down on strikes. Down and in. Got him. And Lester has his fifth strikeout. One on, one away, fourth inning. Well, he's got that good cutter today. Watch it inside. Starts in the middle of the plate, almost like a little slider down and in just under the back of Upton. Yeah, the cutter is thrown like a football, basically. It's a spiral pitch. It moves along the plane of the bat, but it comes inside. That's where Mariano Rivera made all of his money with that cut fastball. It moves about six to eight inches, and it's a late movement that really can be effective. Still making money. Still making a lot of money. <laughs> Carlos Pena was one of the American League's best go-ahead RBI men this year. Seven of them for the Rays this season. He drove in 102 men. One swing could turn this game around. He takes a called strike. Pena's been a real leader of this team. Spoke to the club before the game to tell them to enjoy this game. They had an amazing season. They should just don't worry about beating the Boston Red Sox. Just play the way they can play. Tampa Bay Rays baseball. And he's done it all season long. 18 of his 31 home runs this year tied the game or put them ahead. And if he could park one here, we'd have. Bedlam in St. Pete. One nothing Red Sox on a Pedroia homer. The homer is still at first, but with one out. And a good stop by Veritek as the count evens. Lots of defensive options here. Euclid is at shortstop playing the shift. Alex Cora, the shortstop, straight away at second base on the right hand side of the bag. And he's going to look at the pitches and he's kind of wondering what kind of pitch that is. Little number hit to the right side. Pedroia stumbles, throws to second, and got his man for the second out. Well, you can't teach that play. That's pure instincts right there because he had enough time in his mind to get the lead runner. 
What a heads up play. You can see the base runner right in front of him and pivots to that backside and throws a strike to Euclid, who was covering. Good job by Euclid, giving him a nice target on that outside part. Good job by Umura, who's sliding on the outside part, trying to be in the middle of that throw. That's all about your preparation before the pitch is thrown, thinking if I get a ball in the base bat, I can get even more because I can tell where he is. He's right in front of me. Zero errors for the Red Sox in nearly 96 innings of late in this postseason. Here's Longoria. Runner at first now, Pena, but with two outs. Longoria has been in many ways the bellwether for this Tampa Bay ball club. When he drives in a run, they're 41 and 13, including the postseason. And he takes a strike. It's nothing in one. It's different John Lester tonight than the one that we and the Rays saw in game three in Boston. Both B.J. Upton and Evan Longoria homered in the third inning of game three against Lester. It was the second at bat for Longoria against Lester. He had walked in the second inning, so he had a pretty good feel what Lester was featuring. And that particular night, John Lester couldn't get the ball inside. Well, it appears he's had a little trouble doing that in game seven this evening. That went too far in there, two balls and a strike. Little different tension level in a game seven, huh? <laughs> well, not a lot of smiles, right? <laughs> Especially with a slim one nothing lead. Two balls and a strike, short lead, Pena at first. Well, he's got that curveball working when he does get behind a hitter, especially Upton or Longoria, he shows to go with the 2 1 curveball. Uh, I think it was Vertex's plan to get it into the mix early on. He used it in the first inning. So he knew that he might have to do something different with Lester tonight after the Rays hit him so hard in game three. Deuce is wild, two and two. Line down the right field line. Will it stay fair? It will. Pena around second, on his way to third. They're going to wave it. Here comes the relay from Pedroia. Up the line, and not in time, we're tied. Comes on a fastball off the plate away. The defense is playing him the pull. That's all he's done in this series. He hits it down into the corner. Watch the relay here. It's perfectly executed. Drew to Pedroia. Look how quickly Pedroia unloads. But it's up the line a bit, and Pena slides in, scoring all the way from first. Uh, see that reaction by the Tampa Bay bench. Look the ice. Game tied at one, and here's Crawford. Here's Pena's slide, and Bertic had to go up the line ever so slightly, and you can't catch up to a base runner that's sliding past you. It's impossible. You just don't have enough speed with your glove to catch up to that sliding base runner. The Rays took a chance and have tied the game at one. Now Crawford could put him in front with a hit. But he's down, no balls, two strikes.
In the air, long run left field line. Bay coming on. Euclid's coming on. Sliding try. And it's out of play foul. If he can see it, he thinks he can catch it. <laughs> That's another remarkable story for the Red Sox as he had to avoid the third base umpire, Tim McClellan. You lose Mike Lowell. Euclid goes from first to third and has played beautiful defensive baseball. Showing two. Lester's a tough opponent for Carl Crawford given his command of that breaking ball, but Crawford's done a great job in this postseason. Hitting with runners in scoring position. 462. It gets better as the situation gets more intense. Fastball chased high and away, and Crawford's retired. But the Tampa Bay Rays, as they've done all year, have come back in this game. Carlos Pena scores the game time run heading to the fifth. Lower third of the order for the Red Sox in what is now a tie game at one. Garza gave up a hit to the second man he faced in this game and has not given up any hits since. That hit, however, a home run from Pedroia. And he's due up fifth in this fifth inning of play. Uh, he needs to take note of where he is in the Red Sox lineup. After your team ties up the game, take a look around, see where you're at. You're in the bottom third of the order. You need to have a quick inning right now and get your guys back up to the plate. John Lester surrendered the lead. Now he hopes the lower third can give it right back. And counts a little late. Two balls and a strike. Whenever the Rays have been able to elevate fastballs to Katze, they've handled him very effectively. Anything down in the zone, he's been right on. Didn't get the corner, three balls and a strike. Good ball to strike ratio, 45 balls. Strikes 25 balls. And as we mentioned, a power pitcher, lots of strikeouts, lots of pitches. 3 1 count. All right, pop fly. Uomura at second. Here's Jason Veritek. A nine pitch at that was needed to retire him, looking on strikes in the second inning. Well, they got him with a big slow curveball after he fought off several good fastballs. We talk about pitch count, which guys are now throwing 71 in game seven pitches. That's about 40. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> spoken like a true manager. That's right. Well, he threw 116 in six innings in Fenway Park. Attack rounds the first pitch to Pena. That'll help Garza. Two out. The late Johnny Padres was Jim Fergosi's pitching coach in Philadelphia, and he had a great answer when Fergosi would say, how many pitches does he have? Padres would say, not enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is one of the questions for the Rays in this game. A, who will close, and B, who can get the ball to whomever will close tonight. And so there, there will be an interesting pitch total for Garza tallied. In game seven of this ALCS. Uh, Chad Bradford and Trevor Miller down in that bullpen, and Miller hasn't been used much, but every time Bradford goes out there, all he does is get people out. Here's Cora, he flied to left. 
takes the strong. I think for Joe Madden, it's going to be more of the old fashioned kind of managing where you are watching your pitcher, and the pitch count does mean something, but if Garza's still throwing you good stuff, you're going to want to leave him out there. There's not a manager in baseball will tell you that hitters will tell you exactly how tired the pitcher is. He's going to work for now. 0 and 2. Only John Lester had a lower ERA against the American League Eastern Division than Matt Garza this year. And how fitting is it that they match up in game seven tonight? Inning over. Three up, three down, seven strikeouts, and he's in it. Momentum in the race dugout. And Ibar, Navarro, Baldelli coming up in a tie game. On TBS. And Willie really Ibar takes a call. Strike mentioned, gentlemen, the inspirational stories of Rocco Baldelli, Josh Hamilton. Got to put John Lester in that category too for this Boston Red Sox team. Diagnosed with lymphoma and knocked out from baseball season and came back. And the Red Sox were very, very careful in making sure he wasn't overexerting himself. And he told Perry Francona, hey, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. And Francona called up Lester's parents and said, your son's not going to be too happy with us, but we're going to put a rain on him. And in retrospect, when Lester really got to the point where he was ready to compete again in a major league level, he thanked the way that Terry Francona and John Farrell utilized him so carefully and made sure that they didn't overextend him. And then coming from the chemotherapy, when he came back, they really, his body has changed. If you look at John two or three years ago in a Red Sox uniform, he's very thin, but they let him mature his body physically, and that's why he's throwing the ball probably four or five miles an hour more. High fly ball down the left field line. That's trouble. That ball is off the base of the wall. Ibar hustling for two. He just missed a homer. Instead, he's in scoring position with nobody on. Well, curveball down and in. Not a great swing there by Ibar, but he gets and hits the ball out in front of the plate. Just looking at down that left field line to the shortest part of the park. It's amazing he was able to keep this ball fair because generally when you hook a ball with one hand, it goes into foul territory. But nothing like a leadoff double to start the fifth inning. Remember, Ibar had five RBIs in game four. Pretty good opportunity against Lester for Navarro to push a bunt up the first base line right now. Well, you can see John Madden is John Madden. Joe Madden is thinking about this matchup here with Navarro. He's been a clutch hitter for them all year long. And the on deck matter is Rocco Baldelli, who has not had any luck at all against John Lester. So you give Navarro the freedom to swim away here. He's only sacrificed three times during the regular season, so it's not something they do a lot of. Navarro's proved so much with runners in scoring position. That's why he's allowed to swing the bat. 214 last year, 314 this year. And no sacrifices for the Rays in this ALCS. Aldelia waits next. 1-1 one, one game, 2-0 -oh count.
actual right hand hitter. Learned how to switch hit starting at the age of 13. Asked to find a way to move Ibar up 90 feet. Full count. So now with two strikes, he really has to focus on a productive out. Thinking to the right side against Lester. It's tough to deal when Lester pitches you inside so hard. But with a defense relatively straight away on the infield. Right now you want to make sure at a minimum you advance Ibar from second to third. Valdelli hitting the 
had two strikes. He's got Manny Del Carmen to start throwing in the Red Sox pit. The Rays are four for the last five hitting for two strikes. Two out hit in the fourth inning. Tied the game. Now three straight hits in the fifth. And Bartlett's up with two on. Still nobody out. No side of the bunt. Now, you don't bunt in this situation because Bartlett's so good against left handed pitching. And they've got a left handed batter on deck in Ewell Moore. So Joe Madden is saying, you know what, Jason, I got a lot of confidence in your ability, especially inside. He's very quick inside, and he's a good hitter to face John Lester in this situation. And it's not part of Joe Madden's 10th base game plan. No 23 sack bunts. That was last in the American League. Shifted. Lester retired the first nine men in this game. Leadoff man reached in the fourth, a run scored. Leadoff man has reached in this fifth, one run has scored. And the 80th pitch of the night strikes out Bartlett for the first out of this fifth inning. Like Rocco Baldoni, who he had an 0-2, he didn't make a good enough pitch. This one down out of the strike zone. When you have a hitter who loves the ball in, you can throw it down and then it will entice them to swing over the top. Because that's where he's looking. That's where he wants to hit. And if you entice him to start chasing that cutter, he'll swing over the top of it because he thinks it's that fastball. Iwamura recorded the first raise hit of this game. He's jammed, and Lester will make the pack to first. Runners move up to second and third. This is where this lineup is very, very difficult for Terry Francona. He's studying the matchups. Joe Madden has his lineup perfectly situated. Lefty, righty, power. There's a lot of balance here with the base open. You wonder if Francona will put Upton on. He's been so good against Boston. You got a base open, put him on, but then again, Pena has good numbers against Lester. It's really a rock and a hard place here. And if you don't walk him, it's Francona trusting Lester's stuff over Upton's abilities. He's got a lot of confidence in Lester to make a big pitch here. He's back to the windup with two outs. And a drive down the left field line, but well found. Game three against John Lester. A.J. Upton got a high fastball, hit it over the three monster seats. They are keeping the ball down. They're throwing him a steady diet of breaking pitches. That was a three-run homer. He'd love another one here. And that's fisted to short. Cora's got it. And Lester gives up hits to the first three men he faces in the fifth inning and nothing else. But the Rays lead in pivotal game seven. 2-1 is your score in St. Pete. With Buck Martinez, Ron Darling, Craig Sager, Chip Carey. A one-run lead for the Rays now. 2-1 your score at the top of the Boston order is coming up. Garza has had a terrific run. He has two stretches of seven in a row retired, and he's riding the second of those two. 
as he moves along into the sixth inning. One hit. He's doing all the things you're supposed to do, using all of his pitches, throwing them from strikes, and getting ahead of the Red Sox hitters. Offense. First back door breaking ball just stays right on that outside corner. Remember, Chris struck out with a curveball that slotted inside his last at bat. This one stayed on the outside part. Has settled in very nicely here in Tampa Bay. He was very disappointed when he was dealt from Minnesota, who drafted him number one out of Fresno State. He and Jason Bartlett came over to Tampa Bay in a deal that included Delman Young. He went to Minnesota. And early on, Matt Garza was kind of hurt by it and wanted to prove the twins wrong. And that created problems for himself. You know, I'm definitely hit to that because I was number one pick for the Texas Rangers traded within three or four months and and you do you feel like you have to justify the trade. Wait a minute you just dropped me number one you don't like me anymore. Oh exactly. It hurts when your first team moves you. Two balls two strikes. Two Coco Chris. Jason Bartlett went through the same thing. He was actually signed originally by the Padres, went to Minnesota in a trade, and when he was traded from Minnesota to Tampa Bay, he felt like he was going to prove the Twins wrong. Tried to hit a home run every swing, and there's the details of the trade that went down late November last year. From 0 and 2 to 3 and 2 now with nobody out in a one run game. What an at bat here by Coco Crisp. Looked out of the at bat early in the count. Little tapper. Underhand flip just in time. So much for fielding concerns for Matt Garza. This is a tough play. Coco Crisp runs very well. Garza's got to come over to the foul line and then the underhand shovel inside the base path to Pena. Not an easy play. It took a little funny hop there, too. Stayed with it. Kept that ball in the outside part of the bag. And Crisp upset as Garza's retired him twice. In his first three at bats, here's Pedroia, a homer and a hit by pitch. Six leadoff batters in a row retired. That's the John Lester formula in his postseason, too, and it served Garza well here in game seven. First home run by Pedroia on a changeup. Tried to come inside, but it left it up in the strike zone. The positive left field. Joy has just been, he just does not miss his pitch when he gets it. Especially in the postseason. And since Garz has taken the cut on his ears, he hasn't given up a hit. Well, it's interesting, too. You see the first three batters, a home run and a walk. The last 16, he's only hit a batter, struck out seven. But had that home run happened early in the year, he might have imploded and been done for the rest of the night. He's a different Matt Garza. Another talk to Navarro right before the game about Garza and his demeanor on the mound. He said there was a very clear telltale sign that would tell you whether he's got his A stuff or he feels he's in trouble. Yeah, and that the red flag for Navarro was that Garza started working too quickly. As if he were rushed. We haven't seen any of that tonight.
two and two. Good pitch here, just off the strike zone. Good call by Brian Gorman. Now Cars are facing a man that had the best batting average in baseball with two strikes. Justin Pedroia. Bases are empty, one out. Six innings. And just foul. See most hitters try to stay back on the ball. He more lunges at it. Yeah, yeah. he almost goes to meet it <laughs> halfway. He can't wait long enough. Well, that's why he's such a good fastball yes, hitter. Pitches now for Garza tonight. One, two, and three, and Terry Francona's lineup up in the sixth. Ortiz waits on deck. Toward us. Garza and Navarro really seem to be on the very same page on every pitch, mm -hmm. and that really frees a pitcher's mind up when he doesn't have to think about setting up a hitter or theory. He only thinks about execution of the pitch. Start to get in a beautiful tempo and rhythm. Pitch after pitch after pitch spoiled by Pedroia. Ronnie, how much does it empower a pitcher when you're thinking of a pitch and the catcher calls that pitch? Oh, it's just, uh, it, it honestly does. It frees your mind and you almost get in a telepathic moment, don't you, with your catcher? That you know he's going to call the pitch that you want to call just because you're on the same page. Ninth pitch of this sequence is outside. Full count. Well, the last that bat, Garza pitched to draw it inside, hit him, has not gone back inside in this at bat. Everything away. Popped up. Foul ground. No play. I think that's when a catcher really learns how to call a game. You go into a game with a particular game plan, and then you get into the course of the ball game, second, third at bat, you recognize that you've got to change things. They pitched Pedroia inside early on. He hit the high changeup out of the park. They hit him with the next pitch in his next at bat inside, and now he's gone away. So Garza has to trust Navarro that he's making an informed decision to change the pattern mid-spring and can't panic or question a pitch selection. And again, Petroya will put the brakes on Matt Garza. One and a bat for Pedroia. Talk about collateral damage by an offense in a game in which they have just one hit. The at bat by Veritek and the at bat by Pedroia. 20 pitches by those two men in a one run game. And it was almost like Garza and Navarro lost their patience because at 3 2 with a one run lead. You might want to really challenge Pedroia there. Throw a fastball, keep it away, 
because you have this threat. If you do throw the curveball, he does not swing at it and walks the other Ortiz. Isn't it amazing how the Rays are almost as equally intimidated by Pedroia as they are by Ortiz, throwing him a 3-2 breaking ball. Now Garza looks to get the ball on the ground with Ortiz. Again, the shift is on. Ortiz has walked and struck out. And he's late. 93 mile hour fastball. Well, Buck, you usually don't see this from David Ortiz, but right now, very vulnerable on that pitch away. Anything away on the corner and down. He's more of a He's got the middle plate and in is really what he's covering right now. Yeah, and that's when a pitcher really has the upper hand because Ortiz is committing his swing before he sees where the ball is. Ball one high. Ortiz had that 61 at that postseason home run streak. Come to an end. In the seventh inning of game five, that made it a 7 4 Rays game. Boston won it 8 7. The send this series back to St. Pete. There's only one spot that Ortiz can get to the fastball. That's down in the end, inner half of the plate. And they beat him belt high inside. The ball he hit off Grant Balfour was down inner half that he turned on and hit the three run home run in game five. Garza's has got the whole outer half of the plate to go to now. And that's where Navarro sets up with a run two count. You see Garza hitting his right hip. That's just a reminder not to jump at the pitch. Just throw it. He tried to get too much movement and threw it well off the plate. It's ineffective that far off the plate. He overthrew it. He was trying to throw it 100 miles an hour. Stays alive. That's fisted over near the Red Sox dugout. Well, with the fastball away, fastball up. Those are good pitches. If he wants to get him to chase curveball in the dirt, that's a good pitch. That little slider down and in, to me, would be the most dangerous pitch for him to throw. Absolutely, because it becomes a mediocre fastball at 85 miles an hour if you don't have enough tilt in the grip on it to get it down underneath his back. A new paradigm for the Red Sox. They try to complete another improbable three game to one deficit, win this series, and head to the World Series. 2 2. Full count. Another long at bat. And the next pitch Garza throws will be the 100th in this game. I wouldn't go in on this 3 2 pitch. Take a look at this fastball moving away. Ortiz now can cheat to a fastball in her half. I would stay with that sinking fastball away. Make him hit it to the opposite field. Don't give him anything on the inner half. Three full counts to three hitters in the sixth. Better go talk about it. There's some indecision as to where they want to go right now. The fastball in, but the draw leads is going. Swing and a miss. Throw to second. Strike him out. Throw him out. They went inside, got the strikeout upstairs. The ball throws a strike to nail Padura. Pitches for Matt Garza in this game. A strike him out, throw him out, double play. Sends this to the bottom of the sixth inning now. And the Rays looking to extend their one run lead in game seven. And Pena pops it up a mile high. Euclid. One pitch, one out. 
Hey, but Ortiz at the plate with the fastball upstairs. He swings right through it. That's ball four. And then Navarro throws a strike to Jason Bartlett, positioned perfectly in front of the back to tag out the drive. You know, most of the time you would think, as you see him react to Garza, that that's a good play because Big Bobby usually takes that pitch for ball four. He did not. And then running for Troy doesn't allow Euclid to come up with a runner on base. Well, Evan Longoria with an RBI double in the fourth inning. Remember that early stat we told you about. The bellwether nature of Longoria and this Tampa Bay club this year. When he drives in a run, including postseason, the Tampa Bay Rays are an amazing 41 and 13. And he hits a mile high fly ball to left. That one headed towards Jason Bay. And he's got it for out number two. Very quick work for two outs for Lester here. Love to have those short pitch innings in the middle of the game to stretch out your appearance even deeper. Well, Carl Crawford, the longest tenured Ray, is 0 for 2. Second round pick back in 1999, 52nd pick in that draft. Enjoying his first postseason. Three sports star out of Houston, and he got recruited by UCLA to play basketball, by the University of Nebraska to play football. Pretty impressive athlete who missed over a month with surgery on a tendon in his right hand. Had zero at bats in September. Driven center field, well struck. Chris drifting back on an excellent jump. And a very quick and easy one, two, three, and four. John Lester as we go to the seventh. Seventh inning of game seven. Kevin Euclid will lead it off for the Red Sox. Rays lead it 2 1. Boston has been held to one hit tonight by Matt Garza. And with the pitch count now over 100 for the Rays starter, the Tampa Bay bullpen starts to work. Up. Iwamura gives way to Bartlett. One out, seventh inning. After ball one to Euclid, Garza turned and looked down to the right field bullpen and saw two guys throw it, and it got him a little bit more focused. This is my game, boys. Trevor Miller's the lefty, Grant Bell for the righty. JD Drew 0 for 2. Looks at the ball low. You can just tell, though, by the way, Drew's taking those first pitches. This is going to be a tough matchup for Garza. Drew is swinging the bat as well as he had all season long. in a situation like this trying to protect a one run lead with J.D. Drew if I'm going to challenge him it's going to be away big part of the diamond don't try to get cute and rush something inside that's where Drew is most dangerous keep him to the big part of the field he went out there but missed ball three three and over count Upton really shallow in center field if you're trying to keep him to the big part of the park He's going to have to use those great athletic skills to run it down. That's about as shallow as I've seen any center field play. Well, that's where Joe Madden wants him. He said, you know what? If a ball's going to be hit hard enough to get into the gap, chances are it's going to be an extra base hit. I want to take away those singles and start rallies. Paul Blair like for us old guys. Very much so. And four straight. Puts Drew aboard in the seventh inning for Boston. And now the Rays dugout starts to pace. 
And Jason Bay, the hitter, it's been Bay who has been fooled most by Garza in tonight's game. And that will be keep Garza in the games, the way he's pitched to Bay. Bay's been in between. He hasn't really, he's a good fastball hitter, he's a good fastball up hitter, but it's almost like he's been sitting on the breaking ball. Bay with two check swing strikeouts in tonight's game. And as you see on the box score, Pedroia, the only Boston hit tonight. No balls and a strike. Well, that's a good first pitch. That get me over breaking ball. Hitters are geared up for first pitch fastball, and now you've really got Bay back on his heels. Just that get me over breaking ball right down the middle. Even though it was a hanger, hitters aren't ready to hit that pitch. Well, they also struck out on two fastballs that were by him. So he's trying to turn it up a notch, too. Jason Bay in game one of the American League Division Series turned around a one run game against the Angels with a long home run. And he hits a rope into left field. So the Red Sox have two men on with one man out. So not a homer for Bay, but it sets up the inning nicely for Boston. And Joe Madden. Comes out for a chat here in this seventh inning. Yeah, jogging managers generally is more a strategy trip than a pitching change trip. Unless he's really made up his mind already. But looks like he's questioning Garza how he feels here. Looks like he said, you've been awesome, man. You still got something left for me? Well, he better. <laughs> Trying to come in with a fastball bay, ready for it. Drove that ball to left field. That ball was on the inside corner. It was down, but you start to get into the seventh and eighth inning. Not as much as, as crisp as was earlier in the game. And now Mark Kotze, the hitter, he rounded his short, popped out to second. Left side, strike one. The guards have been doing a good job against Kotze, crowding him, keeping the ball up in the strike zone. His two seamer has been outstanding all game long, but it's the only pitch really that will give him a problem against Kotze, who likes that ball down. Kotze first, then Veritek if Mark doesn't hit into a double play, and that duo has stranded an awful lot. Of Boston base runners in this American League Championship Series. You know, the problem you have, even though it's a postseason, even though you know it, it might be your last game, so you're not worried about how many pitches. Pitchers don't go this far. You know they're not used to going this deep into a game, throwing this many pitches. How do you get out? When you're out of gas. Ball too high. The question I always used to ask myself managing in these situations is the guy in the bullpen better than the guy on the mound? And right now, Garza is still better. Fisted shallow right. That's playable for Baldelli. There's the catch. Drew will tag and move up 90 feet. First and third, but two out. Well, the pitch here from Garza again up in the strikes on a pitch 
that usually Mark can handle. You can see frustration breaking the bat, and that's what he did, broke that bat on that high fastball. It's been a series of near misses for Katze. And now it'll take a hit from Veritek. Buying a wild pitch pass ball error for Boston to tie this game in the seventh. And we've seen Garza for a steady diet of breaking balls to Ver Veritek. So J.D. Drew on third base has to be alive. Navarro's been great at blocking that ball, but you never know when one will go awry. Veritek this year with two outs and runners in scoring position, 51 at bats, eight hits. Foul for a strike. But all of that was forgiven in the sixth inning here last night. With two outs, Veritek homered. Well, on the 2 0 pitch from James Shields decided to challenge Veritek. Big one run, put the best outside like 3 to 2. They were add on. One more run from winning last night's game 4 2. Appeal. Tim McClellan's has no strike. Veritek offering it the breaking ball down in the dirt, checks his swing and keeps it back. Not close. Situation like this, first and third, you just never know on defense whether they might try to steal a run here at the bottom of the order. Ahead of Veritek, a ball and two strikes. The young man with 150 pitches better be taking one more, one more good pitch. He got it. Time to stretch and Tropicana Field. Big game. Garza has the lead late. The Red Sox just stranded two men. Now the Rays up and with the lead, 2-1, seventh inning with Ibar, Navarro, and Baldelli coming up, and Joe Madden and Jim Hickey, but burning up the phone lines to that Rays bullpen. They have looked at the Red Sox lineup, seeing where they are. Six outs away from the World Series. Ramos said, Garza's going back out. Dan Wheeler. Moving around, stirring around. Joe Madden checking with his bench coach, Dave Martinez. They're talking things over with the pitching coach. Lots of conversations going on. How are you going to finish this game? And then a product of the different nature of these two bullpens of the Rays and the Red Sox. You know who finishes the game for Boston. That's Jonathan Papelbon. You don't know who finishes the game for the Rays. Scott Casimir is down in the bullpen, sitting next to J.P. Howe. Well, it's interesting. Core is going to lead off for the Red Sox. Does Ellsbury hit in that place? Ellsbury with good numbers against Garza. But riding an 0 for 20. Two balls, two strikes to Ibar, who doubled in the fifth inning. That led off that frame. And Ibar came home on the Rocco Baldelli hit to put the Rays in front. Just remember that in it. High bar slowed down a third at the top of the lead. Third base coach sent him despite that. The end sent him 
There was a strikeout after that and a comeback with Lester. They would have been out of the inning and not scored a run. And you can't blame the Red Sox defense for playing deep. They've had their backs against the walls no matter where they have played <laughs> because of the home runs from Tampa Bay. Good patience by Ibar, who's been an unsung hero in this series. Very interesting. When you watch John Lester and Garza both having great games, that ball right off the corner, missing the strike zone. Lester gets a lot of called strikes, Garza a lot of swinging strikes. Swing and a drop. Deep left. That ball is long gone. Championship Series. Tremendous extension from Ibar. Takes Lester deep yet again in this series. Tampa Bay has lived with the home run. Ibar, who played such an important part for this team when Longoria was on the disabled list, now big at bats in October. in postseason that an unsung hero rises to the forefront perhaps Willie Ibar will be that man he has scored two of the Rays runs tonight he has hit the 16th home run for this Rays attack in this series and now a little more breathing room for Joe Madden and his bullpen 3-1 your score This is a pitch that plagued Lester in his first start at Fenway. It's a cutter that's supposed to be in. It spins right in the middle of the plate. Nice job, though, covering that ball by Ibar. A long home run. Well, this didn't come out of nowhere. As you can see, Longoria's reaction, another teammate goes deep. But Ibar had four hits and five RBIs in game four against Boston and Fenway. One ball, two strikes. Navarro drives one to right center field. J.D. Drew has it, and there's out number one. John Lester has never lost consecutive starts in his career. He trails by two runs in the seventh inning in a winner-take-all matchup in this American League Championship Series. There are 15 ball players on this field tonight, and not a one of them thinks this game's over yet. Yeah, Boston can come back from seven runs down, and the Rays, a club that have played so many come from behind ball games this year. You're right, Buck. Long way to go. A cue shot by Baldelli, strike one to him. Baldelli out of Woonsocket, Rhode Island. First round pick in the 2000 draft by Tampa Bay. A young man who in the early stages of his major league career was compared to Joe DiMaggio. All I have to do is look at his number. Sox fan 
breaking the hearts of many Red Sox fans themselves. And Lester strikes him out. Veritek will make the throw to first. Two outs after the eye bar home. So eight strikeouts for Lester in the game. Matt Garza has struck out nine in this game. Matt Garza has ended every inning with a strikeout. That's how strong he has finished his innings. Both pens busy with the bases clear and Bartlett up 0 for 2. Strike one to the Rays shortstop. Jason Bartlett with a team that has so many terrific young stars, so many young fireballing pitchers. It's this man that Joe Madden has said is his indispensable player. Not only with what he's done at the plate, but Buck and Ron, 273 fewer runs allowed by this. Rays pitching staff this year over last. Well, you build winning teams around pitching and defense, and that's exactly what they had on their mind when they picked up Matt Garza and Jason Bartlett. Shortstop had been a big void for them, and they needed somebody to pick up the ball. Then you can get a starting pitcher the caliber of Matt Garza to fill out the rotation, and those address two major concerns of this ball club in one trade. High pop fly into center field. Coco Crisp has a little trouble now, picks up the ball. And he makes the play. A homer by Willie Ibar leads off the seventh. Six outs stand between the Rays and the World Series. Six outs left for the Red Sox as they try to complete the impossible comeback here in St. Petersburg. Defensive change. Gabe Gross now in to play right field with Cora, Crisp, and Pedroia coming up. Matt Garza back out after 116 pitches and nine strikeouts. His career high is 11. His high for this year is 10. And a bunt try is fouled back by Cora. If you're Matt Garza right now, all you want to do is check off outs. Literally one batter at a time. Just focus on Cora right here. Keep him from getting on base. Ground ball in between high. And will the Rays defense cost them dearly late? The door is open in the eighth inning. Defense was so good at the start of this postseason. Seven straight airless games, and now the sixth air in 32 and two thirds innings. A classic case of letting the ball play him for Bartlett. That ball will slow down a little bit in that field turf, and then as soon as it hits the dirt, speed up and it beat him. And so Garza figured he had it out, and now uh, Joe Madden is going to take him out. Defending world champions in a decisive game seven. He leads with the lead and a tip of the cap.
Boston still very much alive. They bring the potential tying run to the plate against Dan Wheeler, who's on in relief of Matt Garza. Ronnie Garza was terrific. Well, he ended up beginning with a strikeout, and he did it in a lot of variety of ways. Curveballs in the dirt, first fastballs upstairs, 3 2 curveballs. The one to Baratek had all of his pitches working, throwing them all for strikes, a lot of funny swings for the Red Sox, and that's what happens when you only give up one run and get seven innings to work. So guys, it departs. Wheeler is on, and he was one of many Tampa Bay heroes in game two of this ALCS. Three and a third innings covering 48 pitches. That was the 9-8-11 inning win that evened up this series at a game apiece before we headed to Fenway Park. Are you going to have the Dan Wheeler from game two or the Dan Wheeler from game five where he struggled, gave up three runs in an inning in the third? So Coco Crisp stands in and takes the ball low. Crisp against Wheeler is two for three. But 0 for three tonight. What is that feeling like as a starter who takes the game deep in a close and decisive game and the bullpen is on? And you feel horrible. You want to stay out there because the ground ball should have been an out. You leave on an error. It's, uh, it's a horrible feeling sitting there and you don't have any control anymore and you left the base runner out there. This is what you work so hard to have home field advantage. 3 1 raise, 2 0 count, 1 on, not out. I think the Red Sox have to be very patient, though. Wheeler's the kind of guy, even 2 0, he will try to pitch the peripheral of the strike zone, not always throw it right down the middle. Slicing foul, no play, two balls and a strike. Now he's not overpowering. He doesn't have one particular pitch that's most effective for him. He has to use a combination of pitches, location, changing speed, throwing breaking balls and splitters. So he is never going to be one to just pound the middle of the plate. He can't do that. He has to make quality pitches, and he also needs his defense to help him out. Just the fast runner. Might be a tough man to double up. Throws at first. With nobody out. These are the scenarios pitching coaches and managers pour over during the course of the day. Harry Francona talked about his choices, and Joe Madden and Jim Hickey have met over these situations all day long. What if? What if? Eighth inning, two run lead, crisp at the plate. We don't want Garza to face him late in the game. Bunt attempt. Two and two. Well, Chris had a good pitch to Bunt, too. He was upset, got a little bit ahead of himself, and didn't wait for the ball to get to home. Watch how his body is gone before that ball gets there, and he just jabbed at it, and he was disappointed. He had a good pitch to Bunt. Stop at second. Two are on with nobody out. You give the Red Sox life, they take the life away from you. Well, sometimes what happens is that as a pitcher, a pitch of your repertoire is taken away. That was a split finger from Wheeler. And when you throw a split finger to a left hand hitter down and in, where he's going to hit the ball? Right between the hole. That's where the out is going to be, or that's where they're going to attack. If Payne is off the base, maybe he makes that play. With him holding Cora on, that becomes a base hit. But Crisp has had a good series. Nine for 19, and now here's Pedroia, the only man to touch the plate tonight, but has not yet picked up a hit against Wheeler in his career.
pitches. A lot of times see the pitcher trying to slow it down. Make sure he's doing what he needs to do between the pitches. Pedroia, the hitter, slowing everything down. He's been on base three times tonight. And takes a strike. Now Petroya knows that he only needs one pitch to hit in this scenario. And he has already gained that much confidence just his second full season in the big leagues. Remember, he is the best two strike hitter in baseball, so he is confident he can take pitches and still have a chance to put it in play, even if he falls behind with two strikes. He's waiting for one good one to hit against a guy he's never figured out. High fly ball. He got under it. There's the first big out in the eighth. Seems like it's always going to be laid at the doorstep of David Ortiz, isn't it? Fastball away. That's middle of the plate. Wheeler got away with one there. Detroit just swinging up, popping that pitch. Just missed that pitch. So Joe Madden makes his way to the mound. Pedroia. It's a towering fly ball to left. And that'll do it for Wheeler. He departs. A lefty lefty matchup coming up in the eighth inning. Game on the bases for Boston. 3 1, Tampa Bay in front. Two on, one out. J.P. Howell is on to face David Ortiz. But remember, guys, game five, that seven run deficit for Boston. They overcame it in the final three innings. Well, a two strike hit by Pedroia got it started. Three run home run by Ortiz, and then J.D. Drew. With the game winner after a two run home run. Coco Crisp had a hit in the eighth inning to tie it and drew line drive over the head of Dave Gross and right. Duke scores the winning run. Petroya just missed that last pitch he got. It was a pitch that he's hit out of the ballpark throughout this postseason. Got underneath it. And remember, Drew's hit was against Howell, who's coming into the game. And Ortiz had a big RBI hit in yesterday's ball game off J.P. Howell. This bullpen has been such a strength for the Rays all season. Can they cash in one more time? In their first eight postseason games, the Rays bullpen allowed just four earned runs in 24 and two-thirds innings. Game five, a disaster. Eight earned runs allowed. They rallied in game six without giving up a run. But Ortiz, as we told you, 10 game winning RBI in the postseason. Tied for first all time. Normal depth in the outfield, but I might step back a bit because the tying runs at first base and Coco Chris runs very well. And remember, it's Gabe Gross and right, not Baldelli. With Ortiz up. He's walked once, struck out swinging twice. Ortiz lifetime against Howell, two for 13. That's a 154 career batting average. But one of those hits. Hold on.
That's his best fastball. Up and away, 88. And that pitch right there, really not to be. It's great if he swings and misses, but really to elevate, change where he's throwing the ball, throw one upstairs and then come back down. I'll have maybe the best quote to describe this Rays team in 2008. We're at our best when things look the worst. They had this series three games to one. The Red Sox had even it. And the count now two and two. Waits on deck. And then almost picked off Kevin Euclid. Just got a piece of that breaking ball away as Ortiz extended, took that top hand down. Now Navarro out to talk to Hal, give him a pitch. Bartlett needs to know for his positioning, and he will return to second base. Stays alive. He's keeping that curve just far enough away from Ortiz. All he can do is spoil it. He has to take his top hand off to put the bat on the ball. Just barely gets a piece of it. Boy, now you would think that up and away fastball would be a good pitch for him, and you might get a lazy fly ball in the center. We haven't seen Ortiz drive anything to the opposite field. Ground ball right side. They'll go to second. Close play and in time. Two out. Boy, that's a big play because that represents the tying run. You go to second base and you wipe out Coco Crisp. You're not going to get two on this bouncing ball, but Ewa Moore understands the situation, pivots and throws a strike to Bartlett. Boy, that was close. Well, if Coco could have went straight in instead of that slide that really is taking out the short stuff, straight in, would have been close. Howell gets Ortiz to roll out. First to third. For the bag, he might beat the throw, but he never went for the bag. He went for the infielder instead of trying to get to the base before the throw. So Boston down to its final eighth inning out. Howell gets the high five and protects a 3 1 lead. How close was this play at second base that forced Coco Crisp? Watch the slide of Crisp as he goes to the feet of Barton instead of going for the bag. He is past the bag right there. Bartlett clearly has him out. The umpire, Brian Honor, has great position to make the call. But had he gone straight for the bag, he might have beaten that throw. That wasn't the ball that you were going to turn to, even with Ortiz running. And now David stands at first, Cora at third, and Chad Bradford is on. Try to retire Euclid and send this to the bottom of the eighth inning. Well, Bradford's been outstanding against these Boston Red Sox, but Bradford is one of those guys that's in the game because he usually keeps the ball in the ballpark. Only gave up three home runs all season long, two at Baltimore and one here with Tampa Bay. The one he gave up with Baltimore was the 500th career home run of Manny Ramirez. 
Manny sent a bat over to get Bradford to autograph it. He reluctantly did. And then later on, Ramirez was retired by Bradford in Bradford's 500th appearance in the big leagues. He got an autograph as well. Phil, <laughs> Phil, well, well, fair is fair. So here's Euclid. Four for ten against Bradford. Outfield now very deep. Look at where Upton is. He's played a shallow center field. As we've seen this postseason. Gross a step shy of the track and right. The ball no strikes. Joe Madden is concerned about this matchup because Euclid Bay and Pedroia have all had great approaches against Bradford. He expects them to put it in play. He just hopes it's at an infield. Inside ball two. Well, with this 2 0 count, your problem is, is your DH is on first base, can't pinch run for him. So if Euclid sits a double, a little more difficult for David Ortiz to score. Now, a lot of people would question why wouldn't you pinch run for him? He represents the tying run. Well, if you go into extra innings, you want his bat in the lineup. Ball three. Three balls, no strikes from the fourth pitcher of this inning for Joe Madden and the Rays. The left hander is David Price. The number one pick in last June's draft, 2007. He is getting ready for J.D. Drew if he comes to the plate here in the eighth. And a strike to Euclid. Started with an error. Off the bat of Alex Cora. Bartlett misplayed an in between hop. Then a single. A fly out in the force play. First and third, two out. Ball four there, Buck, the sinker from Bradford. In and down. You figure Ortiz can run three and two. And if Euclid could split a gap, maybe the Red Sox could tie it. He goes. Ball four. Appeal to first, they're loaded. So Bradford walks Euclid to load the bases. Oh, nice job by Euclid taking that fastball way in off the plate. Wheeler, Powell, Bradford have all followed Garza. The stage is set for J.D. Drew. Bases loaded for Boston in the eighth inning, but there are two outs. Well, J.D. Drew always comes up big. This is a grand slam he hit in game six against the Indians last season. And then Frankie Rodriguez this year, the two-run pinch, pinch hit home run at the top of the night. And he had the two-run home run and then the eventual walk-off single off J.P. Howell in the bottom of the ninth versus the Rays. Now, both of his home runs during the 2008 postseason and five of his six RBIs have come in the eighth or ninth inning. He's a guy that doesn't get too excited about anything. Just trying to figure out young David Price. He has faced him. Price was the winner in game two. The irony of that is he won a postseason game before he won a regular season game in the big leagues. What a spot to put this young man. He made his debut in the major leagues on September 14th at none other than Yankee Stadium. 
in relief of Edwin Jackson came in and pitched five and a third allowed just three hits in two runs and struck out four. He made one start this year against Baltimore. Big time fastball. Fastball slider. 95 and up. So from Vanderbilt University to the ALCS. And trying to send it to the bottom of the eighth. And that's a very good start. First pitch slider. with two strikes number one pick in the first round in the 2007 June draft 12 and one in his minor league career Strikes out J.D. Drew with the bases loaded to send it to the bottom of the eighth inning and protects a two-run raise lead. Akinori Iwamura takes the ball, 2-0. Oh. Well, good fastball from Price. Down and away. You see J.D. Drew went a little too far with that swing. It's all played up by Brian Gorman made the call. Iwamura picked up the first hit of this game for Tampa Bay. John Lester started, retired the first nine in a row. Gave up a two-out double to Evan Longoria in the fourth inning. That tied the game. A leadoff double to Willie Ibar in the fifth. He came home on a ball belly hit. And then the Ibar seventh inning homer leading off that frame has kept the Tampa Bay score. And a roller hit up the middle. Pedroia has to unload quickly, and he does. Good play, one out. So how about that raised bullpen? Wheeler, Howell, Bradford, and Price all pitch. Do not allow a run. And now Hideki Okajima on for Boston, and he's been part of a three-headed monster late for Terry Francona. Yeah, he sure has. You're talking about the epitome of a bullpen by committee for Tampa Bay. All hands on deck, but Okajima, Masterson, and Papelbon have been nearly perfect for Terry Francona. Perfect might not push them to the World Series. Here's Upton. He strokes the first pitch into shallow center field. Long run, Chris coming on and makes a sliding catch. I don't know if you can say any more about the job that Uncle Gina has done for these Boston Red Sox. Coming into the postseason, they weren't really sure how much they were going to get from him because he had been somewhat inconsistent. But boy, has he stepped it up. Two innings in game five, two innings from yesterday's ball game, and again on here for another inning. Boston had a great shot in the eighth. Now Payne is up 0 4 3, but he has scored a run. And 
I think we know who's going to come out for the ninth inning just by looking down the right field line here at Tropicana Field. Yeah, there might be a mutiny if anybody but David Price went out to start tonight. Got a chance to get a win and a save in the postseason before he picks up either in the regular season. Strike evens or makes it 0 2. I beg your pardon to Pena. The most wins the Rays have ever had before this year was 70. They won 97 in the regular season. They beat the White Sox in the first round of this 2008 postseason. They need three outs to dethrone the Red Sox. are three outs from their first World Series appearance and the improbable dream indeed. David Price will face Bay, Katze, and Veritek. The Tampa Pan is busy. The Tampa Bay Pan is busy with Grant Balfour. And a first pitch strike. David Price did not throw a pitch in pro ball until May 22nd. Made his debut at Vero Beach. One ball, one strike. In postseason history. The biggest deficit overcome in the ninth inning to win a game seven is two runs. In the 1992 National League Championship Series, the Braves trailed two games to none. They won three to two. And that was against the Pittsburgh Pirates.
Ball four. And Bay coaxes a walk. And the tying run potentially to the plate with nobody out. Now Katze the hitter. Katze 0 for 3. Flied out his last time and broke his bat in frustration. Can Katze be a Red Sox hero? I think this will be the last hitter for David Price. Lefty against lefty. A butt attempt. Boston needs base runners. Strike one. Put your players in the best possible position to succeed. One more batter, Katsi, for Price. One and two. Garza started, went seven, struck out nine, allowed one run, two hits. Wheeler, Howell, Bradford, and Price have followed. It's two and two. How do you lay off this pitch? 95, just off the corner. Eyeball by Mark Clopson. season a step or two slower from the right side if Price can get the ball on the ground. Joe Madden has said that he felt like Balfour was not as animated as usual and that he was just a little bit short of what he's been during the regular season. Big breath by David Price. 
he threw it hard. There, Tech out front, swings over the top of it. <laughs> he knows his map. And Chad Lowry, the final hope for Boston in the ninth. Classic. And Bedlam at Tropicana Field. 